pick six movies. This is the podcast where each season we select a theme and then we find six movies that are all related to that theme. And then we feature each and every one of those movies on its own episode of this very podcast. Each episode is kicked off with all kinds of history and information on the people in front of and behind the camera who work so hard to bring this movie to theaters. Also, most of the movies featured on this podcast are crap. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my co-host and lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we are happy to bring to you Season 16's theme, It's Like Jaws, featuring half a dozen movies that ripped off Jaws in one way or another. And this is Episode 5, featuring 1977's Orca, the Killer Whale. Now, in the movie Jaws, the film positions the great white shark as the ultimate predator of the oceans. But it turns out that orca whales actually eat great white sharks. And this not only finds orcas making great white sharks into the number two predator of the oceans, it turns out that orcas are making great white sharks into number twos out in the oceans. Because orca whales eat great white sharks. And then the sharks are turned into poops out in the oceans. This movie stars Richard Harris and Bo Derek and a bunch of other people you most likely don't know at all. My co-host Bo is doing the introduction for this movie and I've not heard it yet, but I can only imagine that it's as fun as a day at Marineland where you can see a bunch of happy-go-lucky orca whales flopping in the water, splashing people wearing tank tops and fanny packs as they gleefully see trainers feed fistfuls of fresh fish to these oversized aquatic teddy bears. Bo, get on in here and share your insightful intelligence with some of your world-famous fish facts that are all but guaranteed to put a smile on everybody's face as you introduce us to Orca, the killer whale. It's a beautiful day, the episode is open, and people are ready to have a wonderful time. Edutainment, as you know, means fun. He's going to talk about nothing but blackfish, isn't he? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Dateline United Kingdom. Nathan Jones, one of a crew of three sailing a yacht in the Straits of Gibraltar, found his boat surrounded by approximately 30 25 foot whales, their black fins pushing up through the water as the whales first surrounded the yacht and then began beating it with their massive snouts and bodies. One of the whales gripped the rudder in its jaws and pulled a large portion free. Jones and his crew decided their best course of action was to play dead, hoping that it was the movement and shape of the yacht that had drawn the attention of the marine predators. Because of the design of the boat, sitting still can result in the boat taking on water, yet further antagonizing the beasts surrounding the yacht seemed no less dangerous. I began to think, is this how it all ends, Jones said later? But with the yacht grown still, the whales appeared to lose interest and slowly pushed away, albeit with part of the yacht's rudder as a trophy. When some distance was created, Jones and his crew slowly lowered the sail just enough to propel the boat further away from the pod without gaining further attention from the whales. Martin Evans, another of the crew, said, quote, It felt like they had a plan and were angry. This wasn't the first crew to be assaulted by killer whales in the Straits. Captain Antonio Busey was also attacked by a pod of orcas, as the killer whales are often called, and fought them off with a large pole before they finally retreated. It is just one of several orca attacks in this very year, 2021. But if these magnificent animals are attacking humans, maybe they have some cause. Killer whales are the largest member of the dolphin family. They are apex predators, meaning no other animal hunts them. They are at the very tippy top of the food chain, and when humans venture into the waters, that fact remains unchanged. Now, some pods specialize in hunting fish, some in seals or dolphins, some even other adult whales, but they are all killers. While we're in science facts territory, let's talk about their social structure. Killer whales appear to have the most complex social constructs of any marine animal, 
expressing specific vocalizations that occur only within the family pod. And that vocalization is passed down through the generations. They hunt using not only these vocalizations, but they have excellent sight and hearing and sense of touch. And if that wasn't enough to make them a fearsome animal, they also have a highly evolved sense of echolocation to track their prey. They also have the biggest brains in the marine world. Besides the sperm whale, which has the biggest brain period, studies have shown that killer whales teach behaviors to their children, and orca calves will remain with their parents through adulthood, furthering the family line and growing the pod. These animals live somewhere between 50 and 80 years, with some sightings in Australia suggesting the same whales have been seen for over 90 years. Because of their fearsomeness, their family focus, their iconic appearance, these whales have been regarded as near magical by indigenous peoples. Some stories suggesting orcas are merely wolves who take to the water in summer, or that these are the manifestations of humans who have lost their lives in the depths. Given their majesty and power, it was only natural that people would want to capture and study the animals. And the first recorded capture was in 1964 when some fishermen captured a whale they named Moby Doll. Moby Doll was famously docile, and more orcas were taken into captivity as a scientific curiosity, some as sideshow attractions, and sometimes seemingly just because people could. Due to the overuse of this practice of capturing and keeping these killer whales, the population was affected disproportionately, and scientists soon realized that the population of killer whales in the wild was much smaller than they had first hypothesized. It didn't help that humans also like to use whale oil and use dorsal fins for soup and other delicacies. No matter that the orca yields very little oil from its carcass, some, as it happened, was enough. And between the 1940s and 1960s, almost 1,200 whales were slaughtered by Japanese fishermen alone for these essential fluids. It wasn't until the 1980s that the International Whaling Commission recommended that all killer whale hunting be stopped. But some commercial and industrial hunting still occurs, though the commission does its best to limit this hunting to subsistence hunting by indigenous people, who use the orcas for all manner of purposes. There has been a sustained movement toward treating the orca as an intelligent and emotionally sophisticated creature. After the release of the movie Free Willy in 1993, the killer whale star of the film, a whale named Keiko, became the focus of a movement to free killer whales from confinement. Thanks to a sustained push to free him, Keiko was truly freed when he was returned to the Icelandic waters in 2002. But unfortunately, a life in captivity had reduced Keiko's chances of survival in the wild, and he died about a year after his release. Because of the limits placed on capturing orcas in the wild, as well as the social pressure surrounding the practice, most whales now in captivity were born that way and these lives in captivity were brought dramatically to the fore of public consciousness by the film Blackfish, released in 2013. It famously aired on CNN, reaching millions more than it might have as a standalone documentary, making the film festival rounds. Blackfish details the life of a whale named Tilikum, a whale taken as a calf from his mother at the age of two. While being held at Sealand, Canada, two larger female orcas would routinely attack Tilikum, who had no family to help defend him, flying in the face of the important social structure for these animals. Tilikum and the two other orcas were involved in the killing of a trainer, and Tilikum would then be transferred to SeaWorld in Orlando, but with a warning that this whale should not be a performer. Nonetheless, SeaWorld decided Tilikum would be great for the stage and trained him for the crowds. Unsurprisingly, Tilikum was involved in two more deaths, including another trainer. The documentary suggests that this behavior is the result of a highly intelligent creature being abused and confined for a number of years. Basically, Tilikum went crazy, and who could blame him? He was ripped from his family, which we've already discussed is a complicated and important part of an orca's life, and then dumped in a tank with two orcas who abused and attacked him. He was made to perform for the masses until Tilikum snapped. 
Assuming that the killer whale is about as, as smart as we are, though in a very different way, obviously, it's no stretch to assume that they can have emotional breakdowns like lots of sentient animals. And imagine being the orca, an animal genetically programmed to swim as much as 100 kilometers in a day, only to be stuffed inside a tank with other animals you probably can't communicate with. Remember, these animals' language is unique to pods, so if you're not in the same bloodline, you're likely speaking a different language. So you're trapped, isolated by language, and then abused by other orcas, and then on top of all that, you're made to perform in a circus you probably don't understand, only that you have to do it to get that sweet, sweet fish. Blackfish created an uproar, and SeaWorld took the hit square on the nose. In 2014, the company announced an 84% loss in income and share prices in the company dropped by a third. SeaWorld's shareholders filed a lawsuit, not over the treatment of the whales, of course, but over the lies SeaWorld told the investors about how little damage that this documentary would do to their income. And in 2020, that lawsuit was settled for about $65 million. In 2016, SeaWorld said they would no longer breed orcas in captivity, and the state of California even passed a ban on captive breeding. And yet, there are still orcas in captivity, and they are still on display, despite some things we know for sure about killer whales in aquariums. For one, they don't live very long. In 2019, SeaWorld lost Kayla, an orca that had just turned 30. This was likely due to pneumonia or some other opportunistic disease that captive animals are prone to, but that's about half as long as she would have been expected to live in the wild. Naomi Rose, a marine mammal scientist at the Animal Welfare Institute, states something that seems pretty obvious. She says, if you have evolved to move great distances to look for food and mates, then you are adapted to that type of movement. You put orcas in a box that is 150 feet long by 90 feet wide by 30 feet deep, and you're basically turning them into a couch potato. Further, we can get a pretty good idea that these orcas that remain in captivity aren't having a great time of it. I mean, besides the fact that they die in what would normally be orca middle age, they show us this suffering by grinding their teeth on the walls of their pens, and about a quarter of them have serious tooth and nerve damage as a result. A whopping 70% show at least some of this self-inflicted damage. And while some killer whales are kept in groups from disparate pods limiting the socialization for which they are designed, some don't even have that, and they're kept in isolation in tanks of their own. There's a push to create a marine mammal refuge to let these animals swim in some semblance of freedom, but there is unsurprisingly pushback from marine parks who say a shift in environment could do more harm than good, and that may even be true. But it begs the question, is it better to die in freedom, or a reasonable facsimile of it, or to continue in confinement? I'm one of those bleeding heart types who believes all sentient creatures deserve a measure of respect and dignity, and maybe we don't need to see them jump through hoops for our amusement if the toll on the species is so great. For me, the perfect encapsulation of the wild versus captive phenomenon is the dorsal fin of the whales. In the wild, they stand straight and tall and true, and in captivity, they droop, flaccid and impotent, a visible indication of either the physical problems of these creatures or a rot of their spirit, or maybe it's both. And regardless of how you come down on animal conservation, there is no disputing the fearsomeness of the killer whale in the wild, although worth noting here that there are no reports of anyone being actually killed by an orca, just some harassment as we discussed earlier. And if we're talking about Jaws ripoffs, and that is the theme of our season after all, then it stands to reason somebody would have the good sense to use an apex predator like the orca in such a film. But who would have the chutzpah to do this movie? Why, our old friend Dino De Laurentiis, of course. You may recall Season 8 Episode 1 of this very show, in which we charted Dino De Laurentiis' journey to get a new King Kong on the big screen. Well, it just so happens that our pal Dino caught wind of a little movie called Jaws, and further saw the box office said movie did, and so he called upon producer Luciano Vincenzoni. Vincenzoni recalls he received a phone call in the middle of the night from De Laurentiis, who had recently seen the movie Jaws, and he wanted the screenwriter-turned-producer to, quote, 
find the fish tougher and more terrible than the great white. Considering orcas are one of the few species that actually attack and eat great whites, seemed like a great candidate for a Jaws ripoff. And in the wake of Kong's success, Dino De Laurentiis had some cachet. Orca assembles a great cast, including Richard Harris, Charlotte Rampling, Will Sampson, Robert Carradine, and Orca was the first big screen appearance of Bo Derrick, an actor featured in season 6, episode 2 of this very show, and our look at the film 10. Will Simpson was a recognizable face thanks to his work in both One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and The Outlaw of Josie Wales. Rampling had been acting for almost 15 years when she was cast in Orca, and has delivered some turns in art films like The Night Porter and the oddball John Borman movie Zardoz before showing up eye to eye with a killer whale here. But this is clearly Richard Harris's movie, and for all the schlock and pale imitation of Orca, he offers a real performance. He gave up a chance to work with Ingmar Bergman to make Orca, a choice he would later regret, but he's going for it here, and I quite like his performance as the Quint character from Jaws, only slightly dumber, hornier, and more charming. Harris's first starring role in film came with 1963's This Sporting Life, which netted him a Best Actor prize at Cannes in 1963 and an Oscar nomination to boot. With that win behind him, Harris would star in Camelot, and later A Man Called Horse, both critical and commercial successes. For younger listeners of our show, you'd probably remember Richard Harris as Professor Dumbledore in the first two Harry Potter films before his death in 2002. By the time he was laid to rest, Richard Harris had appeared in a few dozen movies and even had a brief musical career thanks to his hit single MacArthur Park. Well done indeed. Michael Anderson, the director of Orca, was an experienced director as well. Just before he helmed Orca, Anderson delivered the cult classic Logan's Run and had directed a total of two dozen movies prior to Orca. Inyo Morricone, who composed the classic scores to The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, along with John Carpenter's The Thing and about a thousand other great movies, turned in a weird ethereal score in Orca that often elevates the material. And yet, when Orca was released unto the public on July 22, 1977, all of these ingredients amounted to a flop. It made about $14 million on its $6 million budget, and without the advertising tie-ins from De Laurentiis' Kong, the return hardly seemed worth the trouble, especially when its star, Richard Harris, nearly died a couple of times due to his insistence on filming his own stunts for the end of the movie set piece. And it didn't just fail financially, critics gave it a drubbing too, calling it everything from, quote, suspenselessly shot to, quote, an incoherent blend of Moby Dick, King Kong, and Jaws. But is it really as bad as all that? Could there be something, perhaps a strong performance or two, and a shocking boat scene that might give this killer whale of a tail a little more bite? For those answers, let's get Chad in here and slice this thing open and hose it off the deck. Ladies and gentlemen, killers and whales, it's 1977's Orca. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Pick 6 Movies. You have found yourself, of course, at episode 5 of season 16, an episode in which we are talking about the film Orca. I am one of your hosts, Bo Ranstell. With me, as ever, is the cosmopolitan, the mm -hmm. uh, the, the the friend to animals everywhere, Chad Cooper. All right, I want to start off this episode with a counterpoint to your introduction. Please. <laughs> All right. Saying that killer whales are too majestic to be kept in captivity is a slippery slope that can lead to arguments being made for any animal in captivity, whether it's in a zoo mm -hmm. or a fishbowl. Should we have dogs and cats as pets? Should they just be running free everywhere? I am of the mind that any sentient creature, and by sentient I mean kind of generally self-aware and possessed of a roughly human-like intelligence, should not be kept in cages. That includes most primates, that includes all whales, dolphins, that kind of thing. I don't think any of those should be in captivity. 
Should people be allowed to ride horses or eat pigs? Pigs, yes. Should we put pigs in space? Ideally. If you're asking me, do I think Link Heartthrob should be <laughs> captaining a ship in space? The answer is, of course, yes. Should we be putting dogs in Halloween costumes? Because I think no. dressing up your pooch as a pirate renders psychological scars that can never heal, Bo. You can argue that dogs and cats domestically have just evolved to a place that there's sort of a symbiotic relationship between dog and man. Ah, as many that. important scientists have noted. Our cat's an asshole. There's nothing symbiotic about that whatsoever. Cats left to their own devices can kind of survive out in the wild to, <laughs> right. to some That's degree. That's what i Just let them go. On that level, I'm like, hey, they're leading a pretty good life. Yes. Are they living a life in a cage? Sure. What about prisoners in, j- in jail cells? That's a tiny little cage. H- here is the counter counter argument to your counter argument. <laughs> is cats live longer in a home than they do outdoors. Killer whales live healthier, longer lives free of captivity than they do held. You said that these whales communicate to each other in their own languages. Yes. What if they're talking shit about all the other pods of orcas? What if killer whales are the mean girls of the ocean? Did you ever consider that, Bo? Chad, what do families as a unit do is nothing but talk shit about every other family that they run into <laughs> contact with. That is one of the most like you, analogous human emotions is to be around a bunch of people that you're either related to or with by choice just uh-huh. to sit around and talk shit about some other people that you know. Like You can sit in judgment and be like, look, we're all reasonable people here. I think we can agree on that. But you Uh see what our neighbors are doing? What a bunch of assholes those people are. You know, that to me is very human. One other factual point I also want to address in your opening. You Mm -hmm. highlighted that the whale Tilikum was responsible for three human deaths while in captivity. Okay? That's right. But we need to talk about these three deaths individually. May I? Please, yes. All right. So the first death was at Sealand of the Pacific in 1991, Uh where a 21-year-old marine biology student and competitive swimmer slipped and fell into the pool containing tilicum and two more orca whales. And these three whales submerged the trainer. She came up a few times, but she was eventually drowned. And of these three whales, two of them were those two female whales that you mentioned that were bullying tilicum when he was a kid. That's right. Orcas are mean girls. Yeah. Well, especially these two. Those two seem like real assholes of the the ocean world. Right. But then, like, they were like, hey, maybe Telecom isn't so bad after all, so <laughs> let's ship him down to Orlando. In Orlando, another trainer was killed in 2010 when Telecom grabbed her ponytail and pulled it into the water, and she died from drowning and blunt force trauma, and she also had her head scalped, and the whale did eat her arm. This is a terrible tragedy. I am not yeah. denying that, and this was really the event that sparked the Blackfish movement. I do believe. But we need to talk about the second death that occurred 10 years after the first and 10 years prior to the last. Go on. This death occurred on July 6th, 1999. Do you know about this death, Bo? Yeah, it was a maintenance worker, right? No, 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 no. On July 6th, 1999, 27-year-old Daniel P. Dukes, who was known as a drifter of sorts and had affiliation with the Hare Krishnas in Coconut Grove, Florida, well, he somehow got past security at SeaWorld and snuck into the theme park at night. Uh He took off all of his clothes, neatly folded them and set them on the ground and climbed into the tank with Tilikum, 100% naked. Kind of my dream. Go on. You and a lot of other people. Tilikum then reportedly thrashed Dukes around in the tank and eventually killed him. The next morning... Workers showed up and they found the body of Dukes floating on top of the whale as it swam around the tank. And during the attack on this guy, the whale had reportedly bitten off his genitals and -hmm. caused so many injuries that autopsy reporters were dumbfounded as to what the actual cause of death was. And the attack left his face in such a bad condition that his funeral was a closed casket. Because they're killer whales, Bo. Yeah. Also, counter, counter, counterpoint. (laughs) There are no recorded instances of a killer whale just eating a person out in the wild, but pin them up and take them out of that element. And then they go a little, I I think the technical term is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Yeah. And and start eating people. Counter, 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 counterpoint. The same thing is true about chimpanzees ripping off people's faces. You cage them up and they go a little bit bananas. Counter, 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 counterpoint. 
that chimpanzees are assholes in the wild too you just put them in a zoo or uh carry them around like bubbles the chimp and it just makes them more of a jerk which goes to to show like i do believe as i said earlier that there is a classification of animals that have a certain like social structure and intellectual capacity if you will that just i think it's sort of immoral to hold them in confinement i believe that in all species there is a certain number of individuals that are jerks and assholes <laughs> so are you saying that for zoos and aquariums and the like mm -hmm. the real test is let's just try to find the ones that are jerks take them out of the wild it improves the lifespan and the quality of life of all the other animals in the wild because we've removed like larry the asshole orca and the then we put them on display and have them jump through hoops of fire and stuff for human consumption. But what you're describing is the American penal system and the fact that we let prisoners perform in rodeos. You're right. Basically, what I'm <laughs> aiming at is sort of an aquatic stir crazy. <laughs> Let's talk about the movie Orca. We open on just black screen and credits and whale songs. <laughs> As we see the title, you know, Orca. And Dino De Laurentiis presents... Well, you know, that's the mark of quality, Chad. This is the fifth movie we've reviewed that has his fingerprints on it. And it won't be the last, I'm no. sure. Also, I'd never seen this movie till a few weeks ago. I'd always heard it stunk. <laughs> and that's not wrong. But also, it's a movie that, as we discussed at the time of you watching it, that has a couple of moments that you will never forget no. as a film. But So when we finally get past all the credits and whatnot, we open on this glorious dawn on the ocean and a pair of orcas breaching is what it's called when they're jumping up in the air and whatnot. Is that what that's called? Yeah. And it's very much a superimposed shot of some killer whales jumping up out of the water in like a sea world or something yeah it's terrible yeah that they've superimposed over the shot of the ocean morning mm -hmm. it's a mommy whale and a daddy whale and they are in love because the music tells us they're in love i think they could only be more in love if bj thomas chimed in crooning about raindrops falling on their heads as these two rode around on a bicycle out in the country field you know with grass up to their dorsal fins as we see him kind of swimming around and being in love and stuff then it this whole sequence kind of ends with them just breaching somewhere like jumping up for joy of boy i really love you eh? and the other one being like i love you too eh? Dude, this matting of them breaching first off this goes on way too long and it looks horrible it's the equivalent of bad photoshop you know like where someone's holding dish soap and they have two left hands and you're like did no one catch this how did this get past <laughs> editors and some sort of quality control yeah well some people are freaks chad that accounts for the two left hands thing <laughs> But yes, you're right. It looks really shoddy even by 1977 standards. Uh-huh. And when we leave that, we cut to Dr. Rachel, who is a played by Charlotte Rampling in this movie, where like we see a tent and we're following this cable that is a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder playing mm -hmm. whale sounds. And we keep following that cable until it goes underwater and we see Dr. Rachel diving. She's scuba diving to check something, check this buoy, check this speaker, who knows. It's never addressed and we don't talk about it anymore. What's important here, Chad, is that this movie draws a line in the sand early to basically say this ain't your daddy's jaws. Mm -mm. Where a great white shark starts swimming close to Dr. Rachel and she sees it and is hiding to the point that she's trying to like put a rock over the little rift in the coral where she's hiding so she can, you know, be out of sight of this shark. She grabs a rock and puts it over her head to hide from this shark. The silliness of this is difficult to describe. It would be as though someone found themselves in the woods and then grabbed just a fallen tree branch to hide behind as a grizzly bear approaches very much so <laughs> and so the shark is just like hey you're not fooling anybody she drops the rock yeah and that alerts the shark the shark's like huh what was that noise hey hey you try to hide from me and <laughs> so above the waves as this shark is menacing dr rachel we see one of the stars of the movie the ship the bumpo sailing with its crew uh of keenan Wynn as novak the older dude 
he was Chester Copperpot in The Goonies, but he only appears as that character in a newspaper photo. I personally know him as the bad guy in Disney's The Shaggy DA, which featured Dean Jones, Bo, and not Fred McMurray. Uh, I mean, could have been either. Lest you get those two confused again. <laughs> he was also the, the guy that got his feet eaten off in Piranha. Oh, was that him? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. He's fishing. That's right. I forgot uh-huh. about that. Hmm. What a career. Yeah, truly one of the greats. <laughs> and then we see the the real hero of our movie, Richard Harris, up in the crow's nest, like keeping an eye out for sharks and whatnot to catch, as we will later learn. When you see that Richard Harris is in a movie, what do you initially think about that? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Because it's me, I think of Orca, uh, and I get very excited. I usually think, am I going to be able to guess his blood alcohol level by eyeballing his performance? I find that he is probably like 80% sober in Orca. What? Which is, yeah. He's not been 80% sober ever. <laughs> Well, he is Irish. So when we first see him, it's like Keenan Wynn, uh, a.k.a. Novak. Well, you see anything up there, Richard Harris? And he's like, no, I don't see anything. There's nothing out here. I don't even see a great white flounder. We cut over to Bo Derek, who's in full glamour makeup. She's working as a deckhand on this boat. (laughs) Yeah, right. And she's 20 years old when this movie is made. And she goes over and kisses this guy named Paul, who's driving the boat. So Paul and Bo Derek are in a relationship in our movie. So let's get to the good stuff. Yes. Richard Harris sees the shark fin that's harassing Dr. Rachel, and he's like, look at that over there. There's a shark. Go after it. Dorsal fin, 10 o'clock. No, wait. She's 2 o'clock. 3 o'clock. The boat keeps moving. 7 o'clock. Heck, it's 5 o'clock somewhere, boys. I put on some dry kick Murphys, and let's have a double elimination bare knuckle ballyhoo. <laughs> that shark's got to be 25 feet. No, 50 feet. It's a hundred feet. How long is a foot? I'm only familiar with the metric system. I like that this movie continually makes fun of how stupid Richard Harris is. He's the dumbest fisherman in the history of ever. (laughs) It's the best. Quick, catch him before his batteries run out. That's when he explodes. Anybody seen Roy Scheider? Don't let him poach me shark. And there's a skiff that Charlotte Rampling, a.k.a. Dr. Rachel, is apparently has come from or is just hanging out that's piloted by Keith Carradine in this movie. No, it's Robert Carradine. Ah, whichever. There's a big difference between Keith and Robert Carradine. One was the guy who wasn't Anthony Edwards in Revenge of the Nerds, and the other one's Keith Carradine. That's true. The skiff is trying to block the bumpo, the Richard Harris's boat. There's a diver down below! Yeah. Don't come this way! (laughs) That was my nerd laugh. It's pretty good. <laughs> you can tell by how little I recognized it. I just didn't want you to think I was having some sort of a, an episode. Look, we're of an age where a stroke can happen anytime. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you tasted pennies. Someone's making toast. Mm, are those almonds I smell? <laughs> Robert Carradine finally gets Dr. Rachel into this skiff that he's piloting. And before she takes off her like diving cap... Richard Harris is really reading him the riot act. He's like, what are you doing? Why are you sailing that little boat in front of mine? I couldn't run you over. I'm trying to kill a shark here for guts. And then she takes off the, the ski or the scuba hat. That's probably not what it's called. That's not the technical term for it. The top of her suit. And he's like, oh, Faith and Bagor, it's a pretty lady. And that shuts Richard Harris up for a second. She's like, listen, what did you think you were doing out there? I'm trying to do aquatic research. Paul, the boat captain, he pops his head out of this window and he he says, nice one, baby. You may have lost us 250,000 bucks. Calls her baby. You can't call a strange woman baby unless you're Austin Powers. Right, yeah. Like Paul, it turns out, was actually a former spy frozen in the 60s and thought out, but only to realize, and in true uh, Austin Powers fashion, if that were a real movie, when they thaw him out, they're like, look, you're completely unsuited for modern life, so (laughs) we're just going to shove you on this boat with this drunk and let you go catch giant fish. You think it'll ever be appropriate to do an Austin Powers impression again? Because back in the 90s and the early aughts, Austin Powers impressions were just ubiquitous. Yeah, but I think much like then and now, if you hear someone doing it, Uh there's such a social stigma attached to it that it's a good indicator that that is somebody that you don't need in your life. Unless it's really 
ironic. Like if I'm at the zoo and I see a couple of monkeys having sex and you give it a nice, oh, behave. I'm not going to give you a yellow card for that. I'm probably going to laugh. I don't know that I can go with you on that. I think the only proper reaction to that is, hey, these (laughs) monkeys are fucking. (laughs) So we're back on the boat and Richard Harris, still stunned that it's a woman who has now boarded his vessel. He really dials up his drunken anger and he throws in a little bit of misogyny. You have any idea what an aquarium would pay for a great white shark? $10,000 a foot? And I'm like, I don't think that that's the unit of measure that aquariums <laughs> use to pay for fish. It's right. not a fruit roll-up. Yeah, you think that most large <laughs> national aquariums or air national aquarium uh, organizations are like, <laughs> you got a sand shark, did you? How big is it? Three feet? Well, that's $30,000, my friend. <laughs> While well, all of this drunken screaming uh, between strangers continues, young Bo Derek climbs up on the mast and she sees this robotic fin zipping around in the water and she shouts out, it's a sh- 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 shark! 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 (laughs) Richard Harris gets Dr. Rachel onto the ship along with Robert Carradine. Or no, I apologize. Robert Carradine just pilots the skiff away. Yeah. And he's like, this lady, doctor, she's mine now. Yeah. You there, lassie. As I return for me saving your life, you can cook us a good meal and wash me clothes later. I've got some good news for you and some bad news for you. The good news, I only got one pair of underwear for you to wash. The bad news, I've only got one pair of underwear for you to wash. (laughs) (laughs) Looks like I've been melting Hershey bars and doing spit takes with cream corn in my mouth. (laughs) You never thought you'd see skid marks on the ocean, but here they are. And what's worse, it's on both sides. (laughs) I bought me one of them pairs of reversible underwear. I marked it up north and south. And east and west. There's skid marks on the back and the front. And the sides somehow. I know what you're thinking. I probably used it for toilet paper. (laughs) Truth is, I don't use toilet paper. But you probably already figured that one out, didn't you? We also use it to clear all all the old oil out of the engine. And when I say old oil out of the engine, I mean I stick it in my arsehole and really give it a good ring around. (laughs) Oh my god. Anyway, so as Robert Carradine pilots his skiff away, I'll be safe on this tiny little boat off in the distance rather than being with you on the big boat. Don't worry about me! Apparently the engine stalls or something, Uh so he's cranking it like a lawnmower (laughs) and then just immediately falls into the water. Which is great because at this point, Richard Harris sees this and goes, what are you doing, you idiot? Dude, he just met these people. Robert Carradine could be her husband or boyfriend or son, and he's just like, look at this idiot. He's falling in the water like he's a drunken idiot. Oh, I love it so much. So this shark is coming for him, Uh huh. and everybody on the boat is like, oh, oh my God, we're about to see a, a human being consumed by a shark before our eyes. And then, Chad. Uh-huh. The real star of the film appears, which is Orca. And hits this shark, uh-huh. broadsides it, T-bones the shark. Yep. Sends it flying up into the air. Ker-splash. And then starts eating it. And Richard Harris is just like, well, son of a, what the hell was that? And Dr. Rachel says, there's only one creature in the world who can do that. A killer whale. And then the orca swims away. Hey, no need to thank me for saving your life. You know, either way, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> it's a little whale humor, dear. So, uh, see you guys later. Goo, 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 goo. All in a day's work, dear. We'll see you guys <laughs> later. I'm going to go hang out with my pot a little bit, so... I'm a real live and let live kind of killer whale, eh? So I guess I may uh, never see you guys again. If I don't, hey, have the best life you can have. Be your best selves, all right? See you later, everybody. And so he leaves. <laughs> also, look, that last scene is so epically bad. It almost looks intentionally bad. The clip together stock footage of like clearly multiple great white sharks that they're pretending is the same. Like they're different colors and lengths. None of this looks in any way believable. No. No, no, it is multiple stock footage bits kind of pieced together along with whatever crappy dorsal fin that they forged. When the orca hits the shark, I mean, the shark looks like it's made of hard plastic. It looks like they took a giant air tank and just painted it gray and drew a shark face on it. It's very good. 
then away from this scene, we follow Dr. Rachel to a lecture hall where uh-huh. she is giving a big speech about how awesome killer whales are. This is without challenge the most powerful animal on the globe. The killer whale. It is a mammal with warm blood and found in every sea. The ancient Romans called it Orco Carrot, Latin for the bringer of death. The adult male measures around 30 feet long but can grow up to 45 feet and they weigh more than anything ever weighed in the history of the planet Earth. It is the fastest animal that anyone has ever seen ever and behind me you see stock footage from SeaWorld or possibly Marine Land. Here you get to see the killer whale in its most recognizable guise. Tamed on exhibition. But don't kid yourself for a moment. If given a chance, the Orca whale will kill you, your family, your friends, and your co-workers. They will burn down your home and the homes of your neighbors just to send a message. What's black and white and ready to eat small children while simultaneously lowering your credit score? Answer the Orca whale. My favorite part of her presentation is when she pulls down the brain chart. (laughs) Yeah. Where she says, killer whales are among the most intelligent species on the face of the planet. Here are some drawings of brains. Here's a monkey. Here's people. Here's a killer whale. And then here's God. God, of course, is the biggest. Then killer whale is number two. Then people are distant number seven. And this whole like crowd of students are just furiously taking notes like, oh my God, Dr. Rachel really knows what she's talking about. <laughs> She also says that, like humans, whales have a profound instinct for vengeance. They defend their honor. They get payback. Reprisal, retribution, retaliation, revenge, vindication. Any and all wrongdoings are woven into their DNA of the orca whale, which, by any means necessary, they shall seek revenge. More than any other living creature in the past, the present, or the future, you wrong a killer whale, and that wrong shall be righted. Killer whales are much like Edward Woodward in The Equalizer, or perhaps the (laughs) A-Team. If you can find a killer whale and no one else can help, Perhaps you can hire them. She does say the most amazing thing about these creatures is their brains. We know very little about their brains, except that they exist and they are very powerful. Some students like, excuse me, Dr. Rachel, you just said that the orca brain is really amazing, but then you immediately said you don't know anything about their brains. That's right. Are you making this up as you go along? Of course not. I've written several books on this subject and then I read what I wrote. All right, continue. Do you have any other slides you may want to show us? Perhaps something with a baby whale in it? I'm so glad you asked. Here is a baby killer whale. Oh my God! As you can see... It looks like a human being. Look at its tiny fingers. I, you just want to kiss those tootsies, don't you? No, I don't. Is this going to be on the final? Recognizing a whale fetus? That's question number seven. Oops, I let that one <laughs> slip out of the bag. But that's a freebie on the test. Everyone should get at least a three. Did I also mention that whales talk to one another by a combination of pure sound and sonar echolocation? Dude. What do you mean by pure sound? That kind of sounds made up too. All right, let's get to the best line of this whole scene. When she's talking about how they talk and she says, killer whales can speak not just in short distances, but they can be heard over all of the world's basins. And the song that you are listening to right now contains about 15 million pieces of information. The Bible has only 4 million. So in comparison, (laughs) she says, compared to the killer whale brain, human beings are probably retarded. All right. Putting aside the evolution of the word retarded right. in its place in contemporary society as a word not used as frequently as it was during the time in which this movie was made. Sure. Let's put all that aside. Rightfully so, but yes. Time and right. place of the film. Right. She is saying in the context of this film and when it was made that compared to killer whales, human beings are retarded. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Which I don't disagree with. I've met a lot of people, and uh, all things being equal- You haven't met that many killer whales. You don't know what they're up to. I'm willing to roll the dice, Chad. (sighs) Yeah, I've met a lot of dummies. Yeah, it's the old George Carlin line of, think how dumb the average person is, and figure half the people are dumber than that. Last election, 48%, you know. Right. (laughs) Matt's pretty close. How many people don't believe that (laughs) Joe Biden is the actual president? (laughs) that chad i bet killer whales don't have this problem you don't see like a one ocean news where the killer whales are like you know we believe that seals are now poison don't eat seals so we cut to the shorelines of newfoundland which is where our movie takes place and richard harris is polishing off a bottle of breakfast flavored jameson and 
His crew of Novak, the old man first mate, Paul, the boyfriend boat captain, and young Bo Derek, they're all rigging up these orange webbings across a cable that they have in the water, and they're trying to catch something, Bo. We get a voiceover of Dr. Rachel, which is strange to introduce this framing device in the movie now. If you're going to use voiceover to tell your story, you should really do that all the way through your film. But we're a good, what, 20 minutes into this, and suddenly we get Dr. Rachel saying, I didn't notice at first, but my lectures suddenly gained a new and attentive member, Richard Harris. He cornered me after class, stinking of Guinness, boiled bacon, and cabbage. Always asking about orcas and me. I was surprised at his ignorance of the animals. To have fished for so long and not know that orca whales sleep for 24 hours and then are awake for 48, thus giving them the nickname of Firemen of the Sea, was new to Richard Harris. I like that she says his combination of curiosity and ignorance made him somehow attractive to me. A woman... <laughs> 25 years his junior and 100% more sober. He was always asking me questions like, what color underwear do you have on and how much can you drink before you start forgetting everything that happens later? And do you mind driving? She shows up at this like coastal <laughs> netting that they're trying to create. She's like, so what do you think you're going to do with that net? Capture one of these whales, is that it? Listen up, Lassie. We're not going to hurt the whale. It's going to live a long, happy life in some aquarium where it can take out its rage killings on animals trainers and naked hippies high on mary jane i like that it, it, like his ham-fisted way of hitting on her is saying you know you're some kind of girl to be living in a tent and sleeping with a tape recorder and she <laughs> says is there any way i can talk you out of doing this really stupid thing of trying to catch this killer whale and he says well there's one way well if that's what it takes and he's like ho, oh, be lucky day is this that line where she says these creatures are capable of communicating with one another tell me i'm pulling your leg and i'll give you a dollar it's in the neighborhood of that there's a lot of yeah. bargaining that these two are doing with each other pull something else and i'll give you a tin did you come down here because you're so worried i'm gonna catch one of these things and she says no i'm worried that you're going to butcher a couple dozen trying to catch one. Oh, yeah i think we could get 12 hey boils golly she thinks we can catch 12 of these. Do the math on that. A million dollars a foot. We're going to make at least a thousand dollars. I like when she says, you're going to butcher all these whales trying to catch one. And he says, that's not me style. And she says, so you're going to give up then? And he says, well, that's not me style either. <laughs> what is your style? And he says, I always have this reaction when a smart and pretty girl like you says I'm dumber than a fish. Which is the beginning of everyone telling Richard Harris how dumb he is, as well as him kind of admitting to proving it. it to us yeah yeah and before she leaves she's like well i wish you lots of bad luck then goodbye richard harris huh joke's on you girly today's opposite day you're an idiot another thing is i'm gonna be so drunk i'll never remember we had this conversation it fell on deaf ears or drunk ears same thing really <laughs> could you do me a favor before you leave reach into my sack over there and get a bottle of lunch flavored jameson for me i put a ham sandwich <laughs> in me bottle of bullet and i just shook it up real good so now when i take a drink of it it tastes like lunch <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me feel like seven o'clock. Dr. Rachel leaves to go make up more facts about killer whales. And then the movie cuts to stock footage of a pod of killer whales swimming in the ocean for a long time. And Bo, it goes on and on and we get it. It's killer whales. Hey, we're just out here swimming and having a good time. Hey, eh? like you can see me here with my lady friend. We've been seeing each other quite a long time. I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, killer whales tend to be monogamous. So we're, we're just, you know, really trying to build something for ourselves here i gotta say that uh i don't have a lot in retirement just yet but i feel like uh you know we've got a pretty good plan as far as buying a house rolling that real estate into something really firm for us uh that we can raise a child <laughs> we we got a, a lot of plans i think we're gonna take a vacation together pretty soon and just see how all that goes uh try to get a little time away before the calf comes so the SS Bumpo heads out into the open waters and down on the galley, young Bo Derek is filling up a harpoon needle with dope, as she calls it. <laughs> and young Bo Derek asks Richard Harris, how much dope goes in the harpoon? And Richard Harris says, ah, well, by me estimate, a killer whale is mm, twice the size of a shark. So use twice as much. You know what? Make it three times. Give them a good time. Make sure that they know it's from me. And then Bo Derek is like, hey, did you know that in this book, it says that killer whales are monogamous? And he's like, oh, wait a second. I don't understand. What does that mean and she says well you know they they pick one mate and they stay with them for life no 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 i understand what the word monogamous means i don't understand this business about just staying with one person i've woken up in so many beds with so many different women usually quite hungover the whole idea just one it's crazy that's why i'm out here on the sea 
You know how many mermaids I've slept with over time? I think those are just manatees. No, I'm pretty sure those were mermaids. Why don't you stop reading and doing all of that thinking? You're gonna hurt that pretty little brain of yours, Mold Eric. Yeah, she says, you know, we could be busting up a happy family here. And he's like, yeah, show me one of those. Then, <laughs> then, baby, I'll call off the hunt. You show me a happy family. Now we got an argument. <laughs> Apparently, orca whales don't consume as much Guinness and Jameson as me family does. All these killer whales do is they sit in front of the TV and let the lights bounce back they're just talking to the tv not to each other our happy family of orcas they're swimming around in more stock footage and they spot the pod of whales and richard harris sees them and he says oh we're off to the races boys bring me the dope heads on one of those harpoons harris rushes off to the bow of the ship and he just shoots the harpoon at one of the whales but that harpoon nicks the dorsal fin of the killer whale leaving it with a distinguishing mark making it easily identifiable if anybody were to see this same animal multiple times later in the movie but that harpoon not only scars that whale but it passes through that fin punctures another killer whale that just starts screaming and squealing like r2d2 getting unexpectedly pumped full of electricity and Bo Derek is the one who tells the audience, oh my God, you nicked the male and hit the female. And Mercy of God, what is that sound? I do love his merciful God. How do you know it's a man fish that I shot and not a woman fish? And Bo Derek says, well, first off, orcas are not men. Second, you can tell it's a male or a female because of the shape of its dorsal fin. Wait, 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 let me stop you right there. What is a dorsal fin? That's the part of the whale that sticks up out of the water when it when it swims close to the surface. Uh-huh of the ocean uh -huh. that's the part you saw the part that you just shot with the harpoon gun who did that that was you remember just a few moments ago that loud screaming sound that we can hear in the background you shot one whale and it went through the dorsal fin did i and then it went into another whale and that's what i'm telling you that was a female how many times do i have to tell all of you not to give me a harpoon when i've been drinking I have no idea what I'm doing out here. And so this female orca, after being hit by this harpoon, is like, hey, this hurts, and swims to the boat and just basically belly flops against the propeller. And they're like, oh, my God, th this female orca is trying to kill herself. Yeah, Bo Derek says that. Apparently, she's the only one with any sense on this boat. Well, she's so young and sober. I like later on when she gets her first sip of alcohol. She's like, well, when in Rome. <laughs> Yeah. We'll get to that. And this whale starts really howling after it rakes its side across the propeller. And so they, they kill the engine so that the propeller won't keep chewing this thing up. And Richard Harris is like, get this thing on board. Oh my God, it's screaming like the last time I had to... <laughs> Pass one of them government cheese pizzas I ate. It is shocking how little Richard Harris knows about any sea life in this movie. Yeah. So, <laughs> Chad, they pull this female orca up on uh -huh. on a chain, you know, basically this got a crane on the back of the boat, and pull it out of water, and they're like, oh my god, it's still alive. Blood is going everywhere, by the way. Yes. And then... One of the most shocking things I've ever seen captured in a movie happens. This thing just squirts out this whale fetus, looking surprisingly like the picture we saw in the uh, lecture from Dr. Rachel, so that we'll recognize what it is. <laughs> And this thing just, like, bonk, hits the deck. And Richard Harris is like, what in the hell? <laughs> Get this thing off me, boat. Dude, good God. Orca out in the water is like, hey, you got my lady, and oh my God, it just had our baby? Oh boy, this is going to be a real something. I got to tell you, I am not happy about any of this at all. Richard Harris, being a man of action, he rushes downstairs below and does what he does whenever he throws up on the deck. He grabs the water hose and just comes up topside and just starts spraying this whale fetus that's like a gigantic pumpkin into the water and kersplash off it goes. Novak, the old man, comes up and is just like, it's gone. It's gone, Richard Harris. Let's go downstairs and we'll pretend this never happened. And then the movie cuts over to the daddy orca in the water water watching all this he's like peeking up and there's a close-up shot on his eye and i think we see a single tear roll down the whale's cheek as he kind of takes a mental snapshot of richard harris as he's hosing off the afterbirth of his unborn son or daughter yeah it, oh my god it's so good 
Hey, that guy right there, he's a real hoser. <laughs> I think I made a joke, eh? Because he's got a hose. Anyway, I'm going to go exact some revenge on him, eh? That was an unintentional joke because this is re actually really a trying time emotionally for me, eh? So uh, that was kind of a pun that I didn't mean to make. I know probably some of you in the <laughs> audience got a little bit of a chuckle out of that, but I didn't mean it that way. I'm really upset about the fact that, you know, my, my baby got hosed off the back of a boat. <laughs> And then my wife is all strung up and just kind of bleeding on top of this uh, deck here. It's really kind of a disappointing day overall. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you just never see something like this coming, you know? <laughs> it's nighttime. Yeah. And Orca is following the boat. And it's just like, hey, if you thought I was going to let this go, I got to tell you, I'm just not that kind of guy. You got another thing coming, boy. This is going <laughs> to turn into a real death wish scenario. But if I could make a more intentional pun, I think maybe more of a death fish you know, eh? I can't help myself, eh? People have often told me that I should do stand-up comedy, but I've never really had the courage, you know? Also, hard to stand up with these fins, you know? <laughs> I could do more of a floating comedy, but uh, not a whole lot of call for that out here. Even in Newfoundland, you know, you'd think you'd see a little bit more of that what, what with all the water and the fishermen and whatnot. But uh, I'll tell you what, just check back with me later about the comedy thing. Right now, I'm just going to focus on my uh, horrible vengeance that I'm going to wreak on this man <laughs> and his crew. Orca comes in and smashes the bottom of the boat. It's now dark out. And Richard Harris goes topside and grabs a searchlight to look off into the ocean. And he also grabs a gun. I think he's going to kill the whale. And then Orca smashes into the boat a third time, which swings the dangling female killer whale out over the water from this long boom. And Paul, the boat captain, he looks over at the hanging female killer whale and he says, I don't know how, but she's still alive. So we're going to skip over the implausibility of how this could never happen. And Richard Hawson says, Novak, quit smoking your doobies and drinking your flask. Shimmy up that pole and cut this whale off and get it back into water. All the while, this female whale is whimpering and crying. And Novak, who, let me stress this, is a very old man. He shimmies out onto this boom, like upside down. He cuts through the rope that's holding this dangling, miraculously alive female killer whale. The whale drops down, splashes into the water, leaving Novak, a bearded, very old white guy, from this boom, whereupon Orca... The male comes up out of the water with a coo 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 and a mighty roar and eats Novak. Tastes a little bit like beef jerky, huh? Aged like a fine wine, except uh, not wine and more of an old person. For the first time in my life, I was watching a movie and the words that I spoke audibly aloud were said at the exact same time by a character in the film where Paul the boat captain and I both said, oh my God, at the exact same time. <laughs> also worth pointing out that during this boat attack, as Orca is banging into the ship, Bo Derek is injured below deck. Yeah, she takes a tumble and breaks her leg. I thought at first she cut her leg on some broken glass, but it doesn't matter. We just see her later in a cast or something. Before Orca takes off after eating <laughs> Novak, he <laughs> gives Richard Harris kind of the stink eye from the water. <laughs> And this is that point where in the movie where you get like a snapshot of Richard Harris's face superimposed on the eye. Hey, I'm going to be coming after you, okay? I know I got your name and address and your face, eh? I got to tell you, I'm not great with names, but I'm terrific with faces. So if I come to you and I say, hey, Richard Blairis, I'm here to eat you. I don't want you to take no offense by that, eh? Because, you know, it's more to face than the name that I'm coming after to eat and wreak <laughs> vengeance on. We cut to a full moon and we hear Orca crying out loud in pain. Oh, I'm so sad. Me whale wife is dead. Yeah, and he's just pushing his dead wife through the water along with the pod. Uh -huh. And finally, the rest of the pod is like, hey, your wife is starting to stink the place up there, Orca. <laughs> I bet you do something about that. Hey, what do you think I'm doing over here, eh? I'm pushing her over to the beach, and I'm just going to leave her there. Okay, just make sure you do it pretty quick, because we're, uh, we're going <laughs> to I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, all right? You going to the beer store? Pick me up at 2-4. I'll be back in the morning, okay? All right, we got some Molson's on the way. I think Jerry was going to go pick those up, so if you got a can opener, grab one of those if you find one of those near the beach. I got you. Hey, if you go by Timmy's, pick me up uh, a double-double, okay? Oh, you know we're going 
going by the Hortons. Don't even worry about it. We'll get you a double double. <laughs> I know you. I know you're always heading by Timmy's. All right, all right. Well, Pop, I gotta push my dead wife over to the beach. I'm I'm full of a uh, uh, grief and sadness. Eh? Okay, sorry about your wife again. We'll catch up with you later. Hey, if you see the fetus of my unborn son or daughter, do me a favor. Just uh, keep an eye on on where that happened. I'll go pick it up and I'll push it over to the beach a little bit later tomorrow. Okay? Oh boy, this is a little awkward. I think Sally ate it. Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. She thought it it was some of them kelp chips. You know what? It's okay. Didn't even know the little squirt. Is that what you were going to call him? Because we saw the thing that happened on the deck too. Squirt's a pretty accurate name for it. Yeah, that's what I went with. Yeah, squirt. Okay, see you later, Orca. <laughs> see you later. Yeah, so Orca pushes dead wife to the beach where he's just like, yeah, let somebody else deal with this thing, right? Because it's just going to stink up the ocean. Let's push it on the land. There's only 25% of that. There, 70% of the of the world is oceans, and we're trying to keep that clean, you know? <laughs> Dr. Rachel shows up. And she finds the dead mama whale on the shore. And then Richard Harris and Paul drive up in a truck and they stop up on this bridge that's a ways off. And Dr. Rachel is sitting next to this dead animal. And Richard Harris says, oh my God, I just realized I'm not drunk. Maybe she's got some liquor on her. So he wanders down to the shore where Dr. Rachel is sitting crisscross applesauce next to this dead animal, which has got to stink something awful. Oh, God, and she's yeah. reading a book and Richard Harris comes over and he says, so I be see you're reading to the dead whale. I hate to tell you this, but all that rope and chains and that giant harpoon sticking out of the side with me name written on the harpoon and the propeller marks on the side of this here fish. Uh, I've never seen any of this before in my life. Well, I think it's just because you blacked out and you don't remember it. But Richard Harris, this is the orca that you killed. Also, her mate pushed this whale onto the beach. Ah, uh, you're right, Lassie. I was the one that killed this whale. But it's amazing that she swam this far. She didn't swim. She was pushed here. The orca followed you. You think that her having that miscarriage hanging upside down on me ship somehow gave her the extra energy to find her way here so that she could apologize for the horrible stain she left on me boat? You truly are one of the worst fishermen I've ever met. No, the whale was pushed by its mate <laughs> and then about this time we get new character introduced to our movie which is jacob umalak who is the chief from one flew over the cuckoo's nest yeah he's a native of the land and he speaks with that stilted version of english that seems to be given to all native americans in every movie i've ever seen i've never been to this part of the world so i cannot verify if this is how people speak but it's how he speaks in this your friend is right she knows it from school I know it from my ancestors. She speaks truth. She work at university, teaching classes on dolphin necromancy and history of whale limericks. You know I don't truck with necromancers. That's a rule of mine. Is this true, stranger? And who in the hell might you be? I am the chief. You may remember me as the guy who suffocated Jack Nicholson after he got a lobotomy. In this movie, I teach at a tribal school in the north. Quick question. Are you the man who killed this animal? I killed an animal. I don't know that it's mine. I don't own a whale. I was trying to own a whale, but it didn't work out. Why would I want to own this whale? It looks clearly dead or close to it. You know, it's stinking like a dumpster filled with rotten tomatoes and old tampons. I got to be honest with you. I wouldn't want this whale. Dr. Rachel is like Richard Harris the orca saw you you need to understand that this orca will come for vengeance and even chief is like you need to stay far away from that whale it's probably very angry at you. My ancestors tried to kill a whale like that, but only wounded it. The whale capsized their boats and ate the hunters. These whales have great memories, the kind of memory that would put Mary Lou Hinner to shame. Once you have wronged an orca, it will spend every waking moment seeking revenge until it finds you and kills you and your family and your friends. It will burn down your house. And your neighbor's houses. Just to send a message. Chief, I went over a lot of this earlier in the movie. You don't need to rehash what the whale is going to do. I think it is important to know that this whale, it is known that the whale of our ancestors also signed up its victims for a number of inappropriate mailing lists and made it very embarrassing for them to go to the mailbox and find sometimes sexually risque material, sometimes racist material there. Wait a minute. You're talking about this whale. The dead whale? How's this whale going to exact revenge on me? She's dead. I killed her. I mean, someone killed her. No. And by it's not, not my whale. Not this whale. The whale that is alive. The mate that pushed it onto the beach. That's the whale you have to worry about. Oh, so you're saying that necromancy is going to happen to this whale and it's going to come after me? Yes. Yes, this zombie whale will come to life and attack you. I don't like the sound of this. I might be in a wee spot of trouble. Do you have any brunch-flavored Jameson on you? 
if that's what will convince you to give up this mad pursuit of a whale, then yes. And and Richard Harris, to his credit, is like, well, I just might do that. I might give up. Back to that Jameson. Do you have it or don't you? It's always nice when early in the movie, your main character, the, the protagonist of your movie is like, well, then I'll just give up. How about I don't do anything in this film? So we cut to the village church where a funeral is being held for Novak, where only Paul and Richard Harris are in attendance. I don't know why they're having a funeral for this guy at all. I think it's a pro bono sort of thing. I think that it being a fisherman village that they just do that if a fisherman dies oh yeah i think that's the case because there's the whole bit where after the service is over in amine patria and they just are like okay he's done it's a pretty quick turnaround on this thing well they got no casket they got no body they got two mourners and a the priest we're it's, in and out it's about as streamlined as you can get yeah this is a real 10 minute funeral kind of situation they probably could have done it over zoom <laughs> had the technology been invented yes after richard harris goes to the priest and gives him i think some money maybe it's his wages or something i I thought it was possibly an envelope full of photos of naked boys i mean that would be the catholic church but he hands this envelope and he's like you can give this to the siemens fund which i guess is just evidence to your theory right that's why i said that (laughs) after getting that untidy business out of the way richard harris is like hey paul can you fuck off for a second i want to talk to this priest about something sure thing buddy thump 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 thunk hey father is there a way you can commit a sin against an animal well, there's a lot of ways you can commit a sin against an animal but to be honest sins are really something that you commit against yourself richard harris i don't follow at all that makes no sense let me put it a different way my son uh-huh Stop jerking off so much. I'm afraid you and I are going to have to differ on that one, Father. Let me put it a different way, Uh my son. Stop fucking manatees out in the ocean. Those are mermaids, and no. Let me put it another way, my son. Uh You're going to straight to hell. Nothing that you can say or do will ever redeem you. You know, Father, I feel like this has been a valuable conversation. One that I might even remember, but I did have me funeral drinks. And by the way, you need to order a couple of new cases of communion wine. (laughs) Someone broke in and drank all of that before the funeral. I noticed the empty bottles in me hand earlier. So (laughs) as soon as they walk outside, Richard Harris immediately like yanks off his tie and hands it to Paul. Thanks for letting me borrow your tie. And then Paul is like, yeah, yeah, it's a good thing the pants fit too. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to wear those, but. But that good doctor hadn't finished doing me laundry yet. She probably got hung up on my skivvies. You know how I am, Paul. I don't like to wear pants on land. <laughs> then we, we get one of our last remaining characters in the movie. Maybe the final introduction, which is this guy named Al Swain. He's in charge of the fishermen's union in town, he says. Uh-huh. He comes up and he says, Arg, look. I hear you be looking to catch an orca, but that not be a good idea. It scares away all the other fish, and that's how we make a living, catching fish. You see, we be fishermen. Oh, you can make money catching fish, can you? How's that? Do they have gold coins hidden in their bellies or something? Arr, no, that's the fish themselves are the money. Wait a minute. I you saying I could go into a store with a fish and hand it to the person on the counter and they'll give me a case of Jameson? Arr, no. Be ye daft. We don't much like the idea of you catching a killer whale out here. And Richard Harris is like, yeah, I changed my mind about that. I'm not trying to catch a killer whale no more. So if there's some orca driving away all your fish, that ain't my problem, pal. Arg. In comes orca <laughs> to the bay. I figured I was just going to go ahead and start exacting my vengeance now, now that you <laughs> buried my wife and all. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sink all the other boats into harbor. So it's just uh, your boat left, Richard Harris. And that's what happens. Yeah. And so he does. And Richard Harris just watches as this orca like rolls back out to sea where he's like, okay, I sunk all the other boats. I'll see you later there, Richard Harris. I guess I'll see you a little later in the movie. By the way, your days are numbered, eh? Tell everybody orca's back in town, all right? Tell sorry to all the people whose boats I sunk. It was nothing personal. Like, with you, it's totally personal on account of, you know, you, you killing my wife and baby and all. But everyone else is just sort of collateral damage. So if you would tell them, I feel kind of bad about that. And later on, they can, you know, kill me and sell my whale oil to get all those repairs done back on the beach 
the local fishermen have found the dead orca and they are dragging it up with a bulldozer at night. Yeah. About this time, Dr. Rachel shows up and she gives a book to Richard Harris who reads the title and he says, oh, what we got here, a book. Let's see what it is. Uh, <clears throat> Hales and Dobbins. That's dolphins. In, sci- sci- in science, mythology. That's mythology. Look. I got to tell you, I'm an idiot, all right? Yeah, instead he pivots and is just like, so you want a drink? I'm just sitting here watching him push this big-ass whale up the beach, having myself another seven or eight of Big Mouse. And then the fisherman union guy comes up and he says, Arg, everyone's going to be working on ye boat tomorrow, all right? So that you can leave the harbor. Arr. Two boats are gone. We got no fish. It's all because of your whale. You know, the one with the nick in the dorsal fin. First of all, it's not me whale. Second of all, I'm not in a big hurry to leave. Not because I, I want to kill the whale, but I paid a month's rent on the house that me and Bo Derek are staying in. And her maybe boyfriend Paul, all right? I'm hoping we might be able to go in there and see if we can explore each other's bodies a little bit. You know, she's got a bum leg now. She can't run away as fast. I'm England for a menage a trois. You ever had that? Actually, if I can get one of them mermaids out of the lagoon, we're going to try a foursome. <laughs> Do me a favor. Leave the keys in that bulldozer. I've got a plan for later tonight. All I'm saying is you, maybe you don't bury that whale too deep. By the way, there's like 50 dudes down on the beach digging a hole to bury this whale. Who's paying for that? Is that like local tax dollars at work? It's like a line item in the government budget for whale burials. It's not stated directly, but the impression I have is it's kind of the whole community getting together to be like, whatever we got to do to solve this whale problem. A stink like that it impacts everybody. We don't have to worry about none of this. That whale is probably long gone. Sure, it's like a couple of boats, but I think it got what it wanted and it's gone now. I'll be back, okay? I, apparently you didn't hear what I said, but I can hear you. Us orca whales have got really good hearing, eh? All right. I'm definitely going to come back for you, Richard Harris. Are are you telling me you don't hear that? No. What are you talking about? There's no whale talking. All I can hear is the ringing in me ears, and all I can see is the stars in me eyes. Arg, how much have you had to drink? How much is there? I've had that much. They threw me out of the bar, not because I was drunk, but they had run out. It turns out you live in a dry county now. Let me ask you this. When do the beer trucks show up? Does anyone make their own raisin wine? Are there any local prisons where I might find some toilet alcohol? After Richard Harris tells him, like, I'm pretty sure that whale's long gone. The fisherman guy's like, arg. If that be true, why did we see it off the North Point? Which one's the North Point? It's the other way from the South Point. Well, which one's the South Point? Point me that direction. And Dr. Rachel is like, no matter what happens, Richard Harris, do not go to the North Point. And he says, why would I? Why would I go there? (laughs) Cut to Richard Harris at the North Point. He's just standing at the edge of a dock, just (laughs) watching the water. There's a couple of splashes and he's like, oh, huh, what's that? He starts to walk away. Mm-hmm. And then you hear the first splash and he gives it the hoo ha. And then he turns around to walk away again and it's splash, splash, splash. Oh, he starts to walk away. Splishy, splishy, splash, splash. Oh, I heard that one. That's not me imagination. It's definitely not a ghost. Finally, the orca just comes out of the water and it's just like, hey, Richard Harris, you remember me? I'm I'm the whale whose wife and child that uh, you just murdered here a couple of days ago. I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be hanging around, you know, uh, to exact my vengeance and all that stuff. So uh, I guess I'll be seeing you pretty soon. During this moment, though, when Richard Harris sees this whale, he has a flash of the fetus coming out and also a car crashing which sets up this whole like emotional thing for richard harris later but we'll get to that i watched this movie twice and i didn't even pick up on the relevance of the car crash yeah thank you for pointing that out hey that's what i'm here for edutainment Mm -hmm. richard harris sobers up the next morning to start drinking again beside his bed is the alarm clock and a bottle of the breakfast booze (laughs) he steps out of his house onto this porch of this seaside shack home and waiting for him is the chief who says the local men met they talk of you but not in good way in way that people talk about other people behind their back in gossipy (laughs) mean girl kind of way they say you are a coward and will not go out to kill this whale i see fear in your face well how am i supposed to get rid of this thing that i don't know but you must go and kill this whale your whale i like that chief says in the old days we would stuff a whale skin with chicken livers and cover it in piss water and throw Mm -hmm. it in the sea and say some words and then the monster spirit would fly out of its mouth and it would die that's dialogue from this movie yeah 
And Richard Harris says, well, how about we try that then? I'll supply the piss if you'll get all that other crazy nonsense. If by piss water you mean my actual urine, I'm for it. But if piss water means alcohol, you're just going to have to wait for that to filter through. <laughs> when he asks him to do it, Chief says, I cannot. The world has changed. Even our gods dance to a different tune. Oh, boy, oh, I hear that. You want to go inside and get drunk? No, that is an unfortunate stereotype of the Native Americans. I will not participate in it. Sadly, I'm perpetuating an unfortunate stereotype of the Irish people. I don't think it's a stereotype if it's true. <laughs> Richard Harris goes back inside his shanty house, and he wanders around trying to read that book that Dr. Rachel gave him, and then he sees something that sparks his imagination. Maybe it's just a word that he recognizes, <laughs> and he opens up the door to the bedroom where he finds Paul and Bo Derek kissing a little bit and you see that Bo Derek has a broken leg and a cast and we just end that scene it doesn't go anywhere I don't know what the point of that was but anyway later that night Richard Harris goes down to the North Point again and has set up this scarecrow of himself at the end of the pier I don't like to drink alone normally I just drink with Jesus but this time I created another me it's the only person I've ever been able to get along with <laughs> so Dr. Rachel comes down to see why Richard Harris wanted all her camping gear out because he's borrowed <laughs> her tent so he can just basically stake out the north point and she says oh my god you've come down here to kill him and richard harris says yeah i came down here to shoot him but i changed my mind dr rachel tells him he won't show up you know he's probably got a birthday party to attend tonight whales hold their collective pod birthday parties on the ninth of every month plus why do you think he sank two boats in the harbor and not yours. He wants you to come out and play with him, Mano y Huelo, out on the sea. And he kind of blows up on her at this point where he's like, you know what? I'm taking more of the whale than you are. I knew that I couldn't shoot a thing, so I came down here to look him in the eye and say, the killing of his wife and child, that it was a terrible accident, that I didn't mean it, and I didn't mean it, and that I'm sorry, and I hope that the whale will forgive me. And then, so he walks to the pier and actually lays down the gun on his way and gives her a look back like, see, I'm not going to shoot the whale. See how wrong you were, Dr. Rachel? How about you shimmy out of them clothes? Maybe I can see what a young woman looks like one last time. And then Orca shows up. Yeah, just goes swimming through town. Hey, everybody, I thought I heard you talking about me. I know you said you were going to apologize and all because uh, I got kind of that super hearing aid, but I've been really thinking about this and I just don't think I can let something like this go. We cut to Richard Harris, who's drunk again, and he's sad, and he's sitting in the tent with Dr. Rachel, and Richard Harris says, I understand what happened to that whale. Years ago, me wife was pregnant and on her way to the hospital, and a drunk driver crashed into the car and killed her and me baby. And Dr. Rachel says, were you that drunk driver, Richard Harris? And Harris says, possibly. I woke up the next day in the hospital, covered in broken glass cuts. Me car was total, and the nurse says me wife and me unborn child are dead, so as best I can tell, me and this whale we have a lot in common you see i'm responsible for the killing the whale's wife and child just like i probably killed my own wife and child so after i apologize to that whale i'm going to apologize to someone else myself elsewhere orca is swimming through town and he busts some fuel pipes hey i have a pretty good understanding of the way that human beings both use and transport fuel and uh so i got a pretty good idea eh, to make the whole place blow up i think maybe if i crash into these pipes that would be a real gas oh i tell you i can't stop myself sometimes with coming up this fun wordplay once all this vengeance thing is over with i'm gonna sit down and put pen to paper i think i got a tight five in me uh, i just need to really work it out maybe workshop it at uh, some of the largos or maybe the could, comedy store on the water i could go down to gills he's got an open mic night i think on thursdays I think maybe that SpongeBob SquarePants, they got a little <laughs> comedy nightclub down there at Bikini Bottom. I'm going to go try my hand at that. I'll tell you, if I can get past that Patrick, boy, he's a he's a dim one. So the orca is like knocking over the pylons of the shack on the water too, which knocks over a lamp, which sets mm -hmm. fire to the entire harbor. Yeah, it scares a cow and kicks a thing and a thing goes in the mouse trap. It's a real Rube Goldberg kind of scenario that this <laughs> orca <laughs> has set up. <laughs> essentially the whole town blows up as orca jumps out of the water in joy of like look at all this chaos i created huh i thought i was just gonna set this shack on fire but it turns out uh you people you don't know how to handle all your oil and gas and whatnot boy i bet if you're not paying attention you could set the whole gulf of mexico on fire if you're not careful <laughs> and orca celebrates with a lot of end zone showboating yeah. like every time a building explodes orca just breaches the water go 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 
look at me, Curse Splash. Yippee, another one is gone, eh? Curse Splash. Richard Harris and Dr. Rachel, of course, see all these explosions and come out of the tent and kind of rush to the end of the pier at the North Point in time for the orca to roll up and be like, hey, you see what I did there? That's just like a small fraction of what I'm going to do to you once I get you out on the water. Hey, first two rows are going to get wet, Richard Harris. And then jumps out of the water and splashes him to add a little insult to injury here. You know, you think that you splashing me is going to make things worse. It makes them better because now I can piss my pants and no Nobody's going to know the difference. Well, I can smell that. Look, I got to tell you, with my heightened killer whale senses, I think maybe you got a problem with your liver, pal. I would really get that looked at. I don't know that I could call you an alcoholic, but you're not not an alcoholic, if you know what I mean, eh? <laughs> Later that night, we're at the Sea Shack where Richard Harris lives and maybe Paul and maybe Bo Derek. I don't know. And Richard Harris gets a phone call and it's the head of the fishing union saying, Arg, we fixed ye boat and ye sail at six. 15 a.m. You must go kill that whale, or we'll beat you so badly that Bo Derek's busted leg will look like a mosquito bite in comparison. Who is this? Is this that fisherman guy? Arg! No, it's just a random caller, just threatening you to get out of town and go and to kill that whale. I'm never going to be able to get me security deposit back if I leave tomorrow. I paid for this place for a month. Arg! It doesn't matter. You need to go. What? I told him to kill the whale. What else should I tell him? He's talking about security. Arg! If you don't do it, you won't get your security deposit back. That was a good one, Mike. Well, when you put it like that, I'm going to talk to you later, fisherman guy. He knows it's me. I gotta go. <laughs> and so Richard Harris is like, Paul, get in here. And one of the, my favorite things in this scene, I don't know if you noticed this, is the framing of the shot includes a picture of some scuba diver with her tits out prominently displayed on the table. I did not see that. Oh, but I might go back and watch it now that you tell it's me. It's very funny. So he tells Paul, look, how about you take the truck? We're about to get kicked out of a yet another town. I need you to take the truck and go get it gassed up. And and after Paul leaves, he calls Dr. Rachel and is like, where are you up? And she's completely not awake. She's like, what? Who is this? Who? Richard Harris. I, no, I was sleeping. Were you asleep then? Yes, I just said I was sleeping. Because of being tired, were you? So you're saying you were passed out. You had too much to drink. That's what you're telling me? You know I don't drink. Well, then how do you pass out? How do you get any sleep if you don't drink so much that you just black out? That's what happens when you sleep. Look, I can't go over this with you right now. What do you want? I wanted to tell you. I got a plan. I'm going to go out and I'm going to fight that whale. That's what he wants. And I'm going to give him a hell of a fight on the high seas. Richard Harris, maybe giving that whale what he wants isn't necessarily a good thing. Why should this whale get everything he wants? You can't go out there and kill this whale. What about Paul? What about Bo Derek's broken leg? You need a crew, don't you? And I like that he says, Oh, it seems like you really are starting to care about me there, Dr. Rachel. Why would you care if I went out and got killed by this whale? She says, Well, Ed, when I first met you, I thought you were an insensitive boar, but now I know that you're a sensitive boar, and you do not need to go on the water. Richard Harris, who do you owe more to, the village or that animal i don't understand your logic if i owe more to the village i should go out and fight the killer whale if i owe more to the whale i should go out and fight the killer whale i'll call you tomorrow okay clear-headed logic is just what i need i'm gonna get drunk and i'll be right as rain after promising to call her in the morning they hang up but orca is swimming back in for a little bit of mischief <laughs> hey you, i guess you thought that that explosion was gonna be the last of what i was gonna do to this town but i feel like richard harris isn't getting a message because he hasn't sailed out on under the water for his eventual murder so i got myself a little plan to, uh, for his house that is nothing but a bunch of stilts on the ocean <laughs> bo Derek gets out of bed and she hobbles around on her crutches and richard harris helps her sit down and then we get more stock footage of killer whales in an aquarium tank and then richard harris runs down to the boathouse to get ready for his midnight trip to kill the orca whale paul goes to the gas station and the attendant refuses to give him gas because he works with richard harris and then the chief shows up to spread some more mystic wisdom and he tells paul that he needs him to pass along a message of i will go out with him on his boat i will help him fight the whale who lives in a sea cave i will be one of his crew and paul's just like who who are you <laughs> right. we've never met before 
I'm part of his crew. What? I do like Chief here saying, if you go to the bus station, you will find there are no tickets. The only way out for you is to the sea. <laughs> that was their second option. Get gas for the car, get in the bus station. Again, this is 1977. What are you going to do? Like, strap somebody to a giant slingshot and fling them? If you try to walk out of town, you will find all of the roads have been rolled up. Also, there will be pebbles in your shoes. It will be quite <laughs> uncomfortable. If you try to use a paraglider, you will find that the wings have holes in them. Richard Harris, he's in his boathouse, and Orca shows back up to wreak a little more seaside havoc. And back in the sea shack that's up on these stilts, this is where Bo Derek is sneaking a little brandy to see what it tastes like. <laughs> she hears it's something pretty spectacular based on Paul and Richard Harris's rave reviews. Just as she starts to pour um, like a solid three fingers of booze, Orca just starts smashing into the support beams, holding up this shed and letting out a screech so loud that it shatters the glass that was holding her booze. The house starts to list dramatically towards the water. It's like Martin Riggs in Lethal Weapon 2. Yes. Bo Derek <laughs> is sliding down toward the water. About this time, Richard Harris is like, Say, does that sound like a house falling into the water? And wait, beyond that, that sounds like a Bo Derek screaming for help. This is the first time she's been in a movie, but I'd never recognize that voice anywhere. Quick, has somebody hand me me flask. Da -da 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 -da. Destroyers fire on his <laughs> biceps as he's drinking some Jamesons. <laughs> and he rushes in to save her. You know, she's like, slid far down and and he's going after her and then paul shows back up as well and richard harris is just like shine a light on her i can't make out bo derrick down there in the water <laughs> and he throws her a net to try to haul her back up while orca is just banging on the on the floor and hitting some pylons and stuff to shake her loose and like hey i'm gonna get myself a little bit of a, a meal late night snack if you will and you know what they say about eating something in a cast it's just like eating a candy bar in a wrapper eh and so they're trying to pull her up and orca just comes out of the water grabs her leg and bites it off it's the one in the cast too yeah and a uh, bo derrick immediately just ah, passes out and then she's gone from our movie forever yeah the medics show up and haul her off out of the movie can you imagine the hospital in this town i can and it's mostly just a snake kitchen. oil yeah it's one <laughs> step below like a mafia doctor it's the local butcher shop put her on the table <laughs> the veterinarian he does all the horses and whales and people in town and while all of this is going on orca's out in the water just flip-flopping and splooshing around boy i sure got her huh hey everybody i really made my mark richard harris has had enough and he just yells out you're revengeful son of a bitch i'll come out and i'll get you i'll fight you i'll come and get you you win i was like wait the whale just won yeah roll credits we got a whole nother act oh but we'll get through it fast the next day the bumpo sails out with a crew of richard harris uh-huh paul yep. dr rachel yep the chief and for some reason robert carradine the revenge of the nerds yes and yes. everyone in town as they're sailing out the entire town has turned Hooray! out to see him off da -da 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 I'll tell you, the, the finest day these eyes have ever seen was the Bumpo leaving this harbor. They're shooting off confetti cannons. There's like acrobats doing flips in the air. The Blue Angels flew over. They've all got screen printed t-shirts that says goodbye Richard Harris on them. It with individual letters across about 48 people. The town will forever celebrate this day. <laughs> and there's some more voiceover from Dr. Rachel, because I forgot that was even a thing in this movie, where she says, I felt responsible for Richard Harris's state of mind. I felt like I'd filled his head with a lot of bad information about killer whales. All of those things that I shared with him about killer whales being capable of grief and sadness, anger, revenge, pathos, and sarcasm was all delusional nonsense that, in full disclosure, I think I still completely believe. I think that killer whales are capable of vindictive actions like Richard Nixon or Yukon Jack. The grief experienced by the orca and Richard Harris would surely spark some fireworks, and I didn't want to miss any of this. That's why I got on the ship and dragged along the revenge of the nerd. She says that she wants to protect both Richard Harris and the whale. But if one of them dies, the victor shall win my hand in marriage. <laughs> 
If I'm a bride of the sea, then so be it. And this is act three, right? Yeah, th- this is them taking all for the final confrontation. And Richard Harris tells them, set a course for that place where I killed that female whale. And also that weird looking baby. <laughs> and so later, Robert Carradine, as they're like out at sea, is like, hey, should someone be up in the lookout? No. He's not ready yet. You don't have to be on the lookout for that whale. Richard Harris also gives Dr. Rachel a rifle. And he says, if the whale gets me, you might have to kill him. You know, in self-defense like. You can also use this gun to force him to marry you if he refuses. He might not have dealt with the grief of his wife that I killed. But still, a deal's a deal out here on the sea. Do you remember, Dr. Rachel, when you told me about the time that the word shotgun wedding was actually in reference to a marriage between a whale and a person? Yes, I do remember making that up. You made it up, did you? Well, I made it up and I put it in a book, which then makes it seem legitimate. Oh. That's the book that I gave you. Oh, yeah, like that Donald Rumsfeld book where he tried to come across as a good guy. And so Orca then shows up. Hey, cool, 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 cool. You guys didn't forget about me, did you? And Paul, after getting a a bump from the whale against the hull of the boat, grabs the gun and is going to shoot him. And Harris says, no, no, it's me the whale wants. Put down the gun. Besides, I got a better idea. It's time for me to go fishing my way. Richard Harris pulls out a wrap, you know, sticks of dynamite. Mm-hmm. You know, I think a gun is maybe a bridge too far. We ought to fight this whale fair and square. You know, like with dynamite. So lights the fuse on this thing. And as uh-huh. soon as Dr. Rachel is like, oh my God, what are you doing? You can't use dynamite to kill my future husband. I thought I was your future husband. I know how this is going to end. You can't kill him. <laughs> I'm not going to marry you. You're drunk all the time. I'll find a husband that isn't. <laughs> so in their struggle, Orca <laughs> is like, Hey, were you about to try to throw some Molotov cocktails at me or some dynamite or maybe some M80s or a cherry bomb or something? Some dipsy doodles, some zipper zappers. <laughs> and so he bumps the boat again and this dynamite just goes skittering away on the deck uh-huh. and it explodes, but it doesn't really seem to do anything. They throw it over into the water. One of them grabs it and chunks it in the water and we get some terrible matting of the explosion. But yeah, nothing happens. And then they never use the dynamite again. Dr. Rachel is apparently made sick by this somehow, so leans over the side of the boat, over the rails, to throw up. And Richard Harris is like, you better get back in the boat. Get back in the boat, Dr. Rachel. The orca, meanwhile, you see him swimming. He's like, oh, wait, what is that I spy? I spy with my little eye a word that begins with V. If you said vomiting, Dr. Rachel, you were right. Richard Harris yanks her violently back from the railing, but Orca just jumps out of the water like a quarter mile away. It's nowhere near the boat. Yeah. And then Orca flips upside down and waves his tail at Richard Harris. And then Orca lays on his side and waves a fin with a, hey, come follow me this way, guys. Hey, what is he doing? I don't understand what he's trying to tell us. I think he wants us to follow him that direction. Are you sure he's not just cleaning his fin? Maybe he got it wet and he's trying to dry it off. Yes, that's probably what he's doing. But he still wants us to follow him. Paul, follow the whale. Ignore this idiot. Paul, follow that whale. I want to ask him if it's weird being wet all the time. I know I hate it when I I get me wet socks. I bet that's what he's doing. He's just rolling over trying to dry pieces of them off so he's not entirely uncomfortable all the time. And while we're talking about wet socks, did you happen to get me underwear clean? There's no way that underwear could be cleaned. I burned it. And when I burned it, I actually got a city citation because it was apparently a biological hazard. So off they go looking for this whale. And about this time, our Revenge of the Nerd, he walks up topside to just go peek his head over the side of the boat to see what's going on in the ocean. And Orca just pops up and eats him. It takes about 15 seconds and he's just gone from our movie. Yeah, it is a a real blink and you'll miss it and Robert Carey is gone the whole scene from robert carradine leaving the pilot house to him being dead and gone is what 14 seconds i said 15 but i mean it's shocking where he's like hey i wonder what's going on in the- gone and then we just cut to later at night as richard harris is drinking with dr rachel as they're listening to whale sounds it's just that new fish album Boy, they're really creating some interesting soundscapes these days. Dr. Rachel asks him, What is he saying to you, Richard Harris? He's saying, I'm you, and you're me. You're me drunk driver. You killed me wife and me child. Now I'm gonna kill you, and I'm drunk. It's a vicious cycle. 
And she's like, I don't think this conversation's going anywhere. I'm going to go up top and steer the boat for a while. That's right. It's too late for me to turn back. Yeah, all right. Not what I was saying. If you want to have sex with me, we better do it pretty quick. No. I, no, I don't. I don't. I saw that underwear and I thought, I don't want to be anywhere near this man's genitals or anus. The joke's on you. I've been rubbing me crotch against you the entire time we've been talking. You and I have a very different definition of crotch. It's not this. No, it's not that. What about this? No, that's just the bottle of liquor. Huh. It always seemed to head in me hand, even from a child. When I first learned to masturbate, it was just me shaking a beer bottle real fast. Finally, one day, one of my friends told me, you're doing it wrong. And I said, I think I'm actually doing it right. Later, Dr. Rachel is taking over the steering from Paul. And Paul is like, hey, by the way, did anybody radio back that Ken got eaten? And she's like, you know, I don't know. I've got to be honest with you. I owed him six weeks back pay as a student assistant, and I don't have the money. So this is a win-win. Well, it's a win for me. Lose for him. Paul says, you know, you're getting as crazy as Richard Harris. Yes, yes, that is true. But I blame it on all the alcohol. I've been drinking yes. some of his stuff, and I think it's mostly paint thinner. I think it's truly damaged my brain. But I must also say, I find that a bit insulting that you think I'm as crazy as him. Do you really think a whale would marry Richard Harris? <laughs> I don't think so. Later, in the pilot house, the chief and Paul and Richard Harris are kind of conferring. And Richard Harris is like, the whale is taking us north. To the coast of Labrador. And Chief chimes in and is like, if we go much farther, we are going to encounter ice that could crush this boat like a grape. Squish. <laughs> this whole third act feels like the screenwriters read the cliff notes for Moby Dick and Frankenstein and Cuckoo's Nest and like two or three other novels just to sort of tidily wrap this up. Also, this movie has so much promise in act one and then it just fades into act two and then act three is such a fart in the wind. <laughs> it really is. Like there's a whole moment here where when they realize, oh, we're, we're heading north into icy waters, Richard Harris says, you know, that whale's going to eventually need to come up f for air under all that ice. Maybe this whale isn't as smart as I thought. Maybe he's a very smart fish or a very, very dumb one. Because that's what people used to say about him all the time. Well, the second part, not the first part. <laughs> he's a very dumb fish, yes. Yeah. And so they follow. We start seeing icebergs in the water and whatnot to let us know that we are continuing our journey north. This ending is so incredibly boring. So nothing happens in it, but let's wrap it up. Yeah. Paul finally has hit his breaking point, and as he's piloting the boat screams at the orca to ram him and harris is meanwhile real chill because he's been drinking all day and he says that's what a whale does there paul don't freak out it follows its prey for a week or so to drive it crazy seems to be doing a pretty good job on you and paul's like no that's the ke calling the kettle black there richard harris the <laughs> orca has driven you crazy and as they're debating who's crazier the chief enters to say hey we were doing a quick inventory back in the boat it turns out we don't have enough fuel to get back and richard harris is like yeah yeah we'll just stop at the nearest gas station ha, that's just a little joke i make about our impending doom no, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> There's a radar station close enough that they can send a rescue helicopter when the time comes. And they're like, well, are you coming with us? And he's like, oh, no, not me. I won't be there because of me fighting the whale and all. Either me and the whale are going to kill each other or I'm going to win the hand of Dr. Rachel. And then I want nothing to do with any of you. Speaking of Dr. Rachel, she gives us a little more voiceover about how, as the movie was drawing to a close, everyone got more and more quiet on the boat, along with the ice, which also grew at an exponential rate. Yeah, everybody's kind of getting space madness at this point. <laughs> yeah, and so Paul calls out because they almost hit an iceberg and they have to stop the boat. And Richard Harris is like, you better find a way through, Paul. We got to follow this whale. This is where the chief kind of comes out of nowhere to be like, hey, maybe you ought to try to get some rest maybe some that's not alcohol induced i haven't had enough alcohol to where i completely black out to make sure that we whittle the characters down further there's mm -hmm. this whole argument where paul wants to put the lifeboat over the side of the boat so that it's ready to go in case they hit a uh, an iceberg or something they should have just had him peek over the water like revenge of the nerd and just have him get chomped off well this is i would argue slightly better than that because what happens is richard harris is like put that lifeboat back where you found it and paul's like no i'm gonna leave it out over the water so he climbs out so that he's standing in the lifeboat as it's hanging over the side of the boat 
And Orca is like, look, I got to tell you, that's just too tempting to pass up. If I mean, if you're just going to hang out over the water like that, that's my bread and butter right there. He comes out of the water and hits the bottom of the lifeboat, which breaks in two and then spills Paul into the ocean where Orca grabs him and then just eats Paul while Dr. Rachel screams no. Yep, that's what happens. See you later, Paul. <laughs> yeah. You know, look, I think I'm doing everybody a favor. I think we can all agree that this was an incomplete character. I mean, yeah, maybe he had a relationship with Bo Derek, eh? but I didn't see much else going on with this guy. I mean, did we ever learn a last name? Did we have any motivation? Why was he on the boat in the first place? These are a lot of questions <laughs> we're never going to get the answers to because I ate him just a second ago, but <laughs> I really felt like he was inconsistent at best. So see you in a few minutes. Richard Harris goes downstairs and he tells Dr. Ray Rachel, you'll remember some time ago he asked how much I'd make for a whale. Well, all I wanted was enough money to pay off my boat and go back to Ireland. I never felt at home here. And now look at what I've done. Three people dead. An innocent girl maimed for life. Tomorrow's going to be the day that I take care of this whale. During your time of contrition, he still didn't mention killing the mama orca or the baby. Well, because he doesn't recall. Oh, because he was <laughs> right. Gotcha. I had a dream the other night that I killed a whale mama and her baby, but then I woke up and had another couple of drinks and I forgot all about it again. I'm pretty sure that was something I just saw on television one time. It's the next day and we're at the Fortress of Solitude and <laughs> Orca bumps into an iceberg, sending it very slowly over to drift and eventually bang into the SS Bumble. This is all so incredibly uneventful. Yeah. Richard Harris says, that Orca whale. He loved his family more than I loved me own. I'll fight that whale on equal terms. I'm just going to use me wits and me fists to fight him. Oh yeah, and a harpoon gun. And this giant ass gnarly harpoon. Also, give me a few sticks of that dynamite. Also, I'm going to be wearing me chain mail that's got the spikes on it. So if he tries to eat me, it'll rough up his throat. Maybe cut his tongue like he ate a slice of pizza that was way too hot. If he pops something in his mouth, chunk these cyanide capsules in there. He'll think the breath mints. But he's a stupid whale. I've made this mistake many times before. Also, if you would, hold on to this giant electrical cable that runs along the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> I'm going to hit it with a paddle. See if that whale won't take a bite of it. Take this air tank, chuck it into his mouth. At the last minute, shoot it with this rifle. You know what we ought to do? We ought to just break the end of the bumpo off and ram it into his belly. Could you build a tall skyscraper? Maybe we could have the whale chase us to the top and then have some small biplanes come in, shoot him down, and have it crash on the ground. Dr. Rachel, and I'm just spitballing here, but what if you had a bunch of guys with flamethrowers? What if they went out onto ice and just burned his whale to a crisp? Is there any way we could have the giant whale befriend a young boy and we could build up a giant smelting plant and then the whale could lower itself down into the giant hot metal and give a thumbs up as he disappears sacrificing himself for all of humanity that would be good richard harris tells the chief <laughs> hey you better start the engine so we can make all of those things happen <laughs> yeah we are out of gas the chief instead radios an sos presumably to this radar station that richard harris mentioned <laughs> that he made up then richard harris as he's looking out over the water sure enough the orca comes up for air where he's like oh <gasps> <gasps> Boy, I was down there for a long time. Boy, I am out of breath. Uh, you know, I think I'm a little out of shape with all this vengeance. I haven't been doing as much swimming and not getting my reps in. I've really just been doing all the killing and eating. And I got to be honest, you people, a little bit fatty. It's really weighing me down some. And then Richard Harris chucks this harpoon at him and hits it. And and the orc is like, ow, boy, that hurts. I'm about to go underwater for a while again. Boy, that seemed out of line. That was a, a bridge too far there, pal. The iceberg, meanwhile, that the orc has been pushing hits the boat and punches a hole in the side mm -hmm. which somehow creates this chain reaction where a bunch of ice rocks they come tumbling down and crush the chief yeah again another three seconds and the chief uh, is now dead so it's richard harris and dr rachel are the only ones left and they escape to this ice flow as yep. the ship sinks in about 90 seconds they're in a real pickle they are this seems like a real how are they gonna get out of this one chad orca starts poking holes up in the ice as they're kind of running to a more stable bigger iceberg i guess it's like a reverse whack-a-mole he just keeps popping up left and right. Right. And Richard Harris, every time it happens, he tries to shoot him with this shotgun of his. So they get to this kind of ice cave kind of thing, but then Orca hits it and 
causes Richard Harris to go sliding down and ends up on another ice flow, which Orca also is like, no, 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 I'm going to take you out into water. It's just going to be you and me here, pal. And so Dr. Rachel throws him a gun at least, which doesn't matter because it never gets used really, but he's got a gun. (laughs) So the Orca then pops out of the water now that he's got Richard Harris kind of where he wants him and just eyeballs him. But instead of shooting his rifle at the Orca, Richard Harris just yells, what in hell are you? Mm -hmm. And then the Orca goes underwater again. He's like, oh boy, he seems mad. I really don't like to be yelled at. I mean, I know that I, I ate a bunch of his crew and have stranded him in the middle of the northern waters where it's cold and icy. Let's be honest. He's about to suffer a fate of uh, slipping into the icy depths and never to be seen again. But there is no reason to be yelling like that. I think we can all agree, eh? Using that kind of language, did he have to use the H word? You know, how about what in heck are you? Does that hurt so much? I think you get the same sentiment across. I mean, what's the big difference? (laughs) He comes out of the water, Orca does, and lands on the end of the ice flow, which in very Quint-like fashion. Yep. Forces Richard Harris to slide down toward its mouth. But Orca is like, look, I'm not going to eat you just yet. I got uh, another plan for you. So I'm just going to let you swim into the water for a second. And so you can tread water in while I'm going to circle around you just to make you kind of nervous. Because, you know, it turns out that fear really brings out the flavor in a person. So I want to make sure you're good and scared before I try to eat you. And then once he's in the water, Orca just smacks Richard Harris into the air with his tail like a sea lion. And Richard Harris just goes zooming through the Arctic sky and bounces off an iceberg and sinks into the water. Dead, yeah. Which leaves Dr. Rachel to look on as Orca swims around in a tank at SeaWorld that's trying to pass for the ocean. And then I'm assuming she's hoping that the helicopter that we hear off in the distance has a preacher on it so these two can be wed in holy matrimony. You know, this is the day I've been dreaming about all my life. I always told myself I wasn't going to cry, but here I am. I'm so excited and nervous and I can't wait to have his babies, which will, of course, spill out on a a deck of another fishing ship. Then we get underwater shots of Orca swimming around, and then it is accompanied by Carol Connors singing the love theme from Orca, We Are One. Uh Goodbye, Orca! It is wonderful. It is like the shittiest opera you ever heard. To, To put a proper bow on all of this, the implication is A, that Orca has kind of looked eye to eye with dr rachel and is like look i know i killed everybody else but i'm gonna let you live you seem like a pretty good egg eh then go swimming under the ice and drowns because it can't find a place to get up for air and the idea is that vengeance has claimed both of their lives Boy, you read a hell of a lot more into this than I did. I read a little bit about the novelization of Orca, oh. which is exactly how it ends. And the the novelization was based on the first draft of the script. Which was not used at all in this movie. Uh, you'd be surprised, <laughs> Chad. It turns out not a whole lot of difference between first draft and final cut. And that's it. That's Orca. There you have it. The Moby Dickian tale of... <sighs> Richard Harris and this whale whose wife and baby he murdered. But we've seen a lot of movies this season. Uh Uh-huh. One might even say we've seen five movies this season. We've seen movies that were like Jaws with a bear, alligator, bees, snakes, and now orca whales. But, Bo, what if we had a movie that was a whole lot like Jaws, but in 3D? They can do that? Not only can they do that, they did do that. Bo... We are going to get as close to the bullseye as we can, while at the same time completely missing the entire target. That's right. For the season finale of It's Like Jaws, we are going to bring you the only movie that's like Jaws, but is also in 3D. And I'm speaking of none other than Jaws 3D. Now, this is not the original movie Jaws in 3D. This is Jaws 3D. So yes. don't get those two confused. This is the Lewis Gossetus Juniorist movie that we'll be covering this season. You got a coked up Dennis Quaid. You got Leah Thompson before she tried to have sex with her own son in 1955. There's a manimal in there. Oh, I do like a good manimal. And after all of this bad mouthing of SeaWorld and the hit job that Blackfish did on that part, you know what? We should feature a movie that gives equal time to showcase all of the positive things that this aquatic theme park has done over the years. 
sort of. It's not how I recall Jaws 3D, but all right. I'm very excited to uh, tackle it, not just because it's the last episode of the season and we don't have to watch any more terrible animal attack movies. Who am I kidding? I could watch a terrible animal attack <laughs> movies any day of the week. But because I think it's the first movie with Dennis Quaid we've done. Yes. And certainly the first Lewis Gossett Jr. Absolutely. We would remember that. Yes. This is two milestones for uh, a couple of reasons. Could you imagine if we did Enemy Mind? We'll get there. <laughs> that is a movie that I have been thinking a lot about recently, and uh -huh. none of those thoughts are positive. So as always, like, rate, review. You can send us an email at pick 6 movies at gmail.com. Bo, did you know that Pick 6 Movies is now available through Audible and we are now showing up over on Amazon as well. We've made the big time, baby. That's right. You got Amazon Music. You got yourself an Audible subscription. You got yourself a Pick 6 Movies. That's right. You can leave a review there. You can tell people about the incredible entertainment that you get here for the low, low price of free. We don't charge nothing for this. Can you believe that? You That's know? amazing. Yeah. We're not trying to sell this podcast for $10,000 an episode. No. There's no subscription model. All we ask is for your time and attention and your love especially your love because i've never had any of my own no but any final thoughts on orca the killer whale movie only that it is maybe the finest fish abortion ever put to film here here we will see you in two weeks time everyone <laughs> <laughs>